to ARC for another week. Tonight's topic is not what I originally thought it would be, which is about judgment. As a natural lead on from last week where we talked about treat others as you would have them treat you and only using one measure and that that measure should be Christ-likeness being the reflection of him, the image of him, walking in the word, not being here as only, all those good things, right? But instead, as always happens, during the week, God did a little thing here, and then a little thing there, and then someone came to see me to ask me a really deep question about something, etc., etc., and they didn't know that, of course, that's the topic still, and so by, the, by last night, it was like, okay, that's the topic, right? So, if you saw on Facebook this picture here, this is our overall guiding scriptures, Galatians 1.10. Am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Where are you seeking your approval? And this might seem like a, you know, a nothing topic, but it's actually central to surviving life. And in my experience, especially in social work, most of what goes wrong with young people that can wreck them and like, you know, they can lose their whole 20s and 30s before they stabilise again comes from mistakes they make about this topic. So unlike usual, this won't be entirely purely just only scripture and like that. So it'll be a lot about application to your actual life. So this is primarily for, well, it's for everybody. There's no one that can't benefit from this. But I guess if you're watching and you're still in your formative years, like your teens or early 20s or whatever, before you sort of settled into being the more long-term person that you're going to be, this is really important for you. And I want us to be able to not only understand it for ourselves, but because you'll end up parents, you'll end up, you know, in positions and clubs and things where you influence younger people. This is an understanding as a Christian that you really need if you're going to help shield them from bringing harm on their own lives, okay? So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have established your law, your testimony and everything for the purpose of saving those who are willing to be saved. We thank you that you did not move, that you are the solid rock, the cornerstone, Lord Jesus, on which all understanding, all truth, your whole house is built. You are its foundation. You are the word of God. You promised, Lord, that we would not teach each other to know you, but you yourself would teach us, writing your law in our hearts and minds. So now, with this topic Lord because it's so important I really pray that you open the eyes and the ears and the hearts of those who hear it or see it and that you cause them to see it Lord that somehow you cause the message to reach them either directly with the YouTube thing or indirectly because someone else watches it and is able to explain it to them later maybe years later but we pray Lord that the purpose for which you spoke these things would be fulfilled for the salvation and the rescue of as many as possible. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So our first scripture, we need to just establish something about God's character which, without which what follows doesn't make as much sense. So on page one, that's just all that's about, and it won't take a minute. We're going to Genesis 16. So if you have your Bibles at home, Genesis 16. And this is when, before God has made his promise to Abraham about, you know, Messiah and all the rest. So here he's still called Avram, and his wife is called Sarai. That will become Abraham and Sarah soon in the story. But at this stage, they're still called Avram and Sarai. That's the same people as Abraham and Sarah, right? Then, you remember, she's barren, and she doesn't have any children, so Abraham said to Sarai, Behold, uh, oh sorry, um, 
Sarai says to Abraham, take my servant and you can sleep with her because she's younger and maybe she'll have a child. Whereas, And that might sound shocking now, but remember this is thousands of years ago before God gave his law. So it wasn't as shocking as it sounds. So the servant, Hagar, is not a Jew. Actually, there's no such thing as a Jew at this point because he hasn't given the law. But she's an Egyptian. So in terms of Midrash, she's a foreigner. She's a Gentile, right? She's one of the nations. And she's a slave. That's what she is. Jews were not allowed to keep other Jews as slaves, but they were permitted to have non-Jewish slaves, even under the law. So that's Hagar's position in this family. She's a servant. Abraham has probably literally paid money for her to be a servant for his wife. And she's an Egyptian. So Sarai gives her to Abraham to sleep with because she's, she thinks that Abraham must be so disappointed that they don't have children. This is like her last resort, you know. And that sort of happens today, doesn't it? You know, surrogate parents. It's not that dissimilar, really, in some ways. But the problem is, Hagar, when she gets pregnant, starts to think of herself as more important than Sarai, who's the wife. She forgets that she's the servant. She forgets that the only reason she got to sleep with the master and be pregnant is because Sarai arranged it. And she starts to mistreat her, her mistress. So Sarai is miserable, right? Not only is she still not pregnant herself, but now the servant is almost like starting to take her place. So she's, you can imagine the emotions going on, right? So we pick up the story about there in verse 6. Aram said to Sarai, Behold, your maid is in your power. Do to her what is good in your sight. So Sarai treated her harshly until Hagar ran away, fled from her presence. Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. He said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, what, uh, where have you come from and where are you going? And she said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. And then the angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit to her authority. Moreover, the angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly multiply your descendants so that they will be too many to count. And the angel of the Lord said to her further, Behold, you are with child and you will bear a son and you will call his name Yishmael, Yishmael, because the Lord has given heed to your affliction. That's what most of your Bibles will say. Or he, because he has heard of your distress or something like that, right? Or he's paid attention to your crying out, even though she's an Egyptian. So this is the God of Abraham coming to the aid of an Egyptian who has her own gods, right? He goes on to say, he will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand will be against him and he will live to the east of all his brothers. Can anyone guess? Did God keep that promise? Oh yes. Who's he talking about? He's talking about Islam. Islam traces its heritage to Abraham through Ishmael. So from Abraham you get two branches of the tree, the Jews and Islam. One through Isaac, the Jews, one through Ishmael, the, ultimately the Arabs and who become the Muslim world largely. And was God right? What is the Islamic world like towards its Jewish brother? They hate the idea that they're brothers and yet they both boldly claim the same father, so it's a bit unavoidable, right? But was God right 
about the nature of Islam? What does it mean that it be a donkey of a man? What are donkeys famous for? Pride and stubbornness. If they decide not to move, they just won't. <laughs> you know? So you cannot argue with it, the donkey, right? If it decides to stop, good luck trying to move it, right? So Islam is the fulfillment of this. And it's a great nation. It's massive. You know, it's bigger than Israel. It's something like 50 million Muslims surround 10 million Israelis, just to give you a sense of scale, okay? We, the reason for sharing this, oh, I'll just finish the last little bit. So that, that Islamic thing, is that's just a footnote that's worth knowing, but it's not our topic. We go on to verse 13 and 14 as our last two here. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are God who sees. For she said, I have even remained alive after seeing him. Therefore the well was called Be'er Lahai Ro'e, because it is between Kadesh and Bered. Okay, we'll come to what that means in a second. Who are the players so far? Abraham, Sarai, and Hagar. Who sinned? Why is God coming to deal with something who sinned? The answer is, unsurprisingly, all of them. Sarai was ungrateful and harsh to her servant. Hagar was full of pride and harsh to her mistress. And Abraham actually failed in his duty to take headship. He said to his wife, in what was clearly a distressing and difficult subject, do whatever you like. Don't involve me. Why? Well, it sounds too hard. Woman fighting. I can tell you as a man, if the subject is woman fighting, and say, what should we do? So I don't know about you, but I'm running. You know? So it's understandable in human nature, but it's sin, because he's the head of the combined family unit, which includes all the household servants, right? That's how God saw it. You were responsible for everyone under your roof, even though, of course, they didn't have a roof here, but metaphorically speaking. So everybody is a fail, a big fail. And the consequence is Hagar, who God has caused to be pregnant, with a child of Abraham, because there's a purpose for that child, right? She's running away. And we know, actually, she's running home. She's running back to Egypt, because this well at Shaur is on the border between Israel and Egypt. She's Egyptian, right? So it's safe to say she's heading home, which is the natural thing, right? In this story reveals something about God's character, and this is what we need to draw out of it that will help us in our actual topic. So let's look. Everybody sinned, right? So the only one in the story who's not a sinner is the angel of the Lord, Hamelech Adonai. Let's look. In your Bible, it'll say, the angel of the Lord. So when you think of an angel, what do you normally think of? You know, there's the Renaissance painting and Hollywood version with big wings and a white dress or whatever that you call that. It's something like that, isn't it? It's like an angelic being, something. If this was that kind of angel, if it was particularly a high-ranking angel. What does the scripture usually say about the angel that's speaking? Jesus. This one is, yeah, this, you're right, this one is really Jesus. But what is it normally, when an angel speaks, what do you all usually learn about the angel? You learn his name. You know who's speaking. So if it's 
Michael, Michael, it will say that the that Michael, the angel, the guardian over the people, appeared and said, or Gabriel, you know, or Raphael. What's special about this is the absence of any name. The angel refuses to give its name, like it's not allowed to even appear. That's a clue. Then the angel, if you look at what the angel actually says, he talks for God in the first person. He's the, so Malak, angel, means messenger. So he's the messenger or a messenger, every, any angel is a messenger of God. But this messenger speaks first person. He says, I will increase your people. I will do this. I will do that. Things only God can do. So that's why this gets translated in your Bible, not as an angel, but as the angel, Hamelech Adonai the angel of the Lord, the messenger of God, who speaks first person the word of God. And as Veron rightly picked, who else is that except the word of God himself? This is almost certainly an Old Testament manifestation of, of Jesus, because there's many, right? Because remember, Jesus, in case you're new to this watching, Jesus was not created, he is the creator, so he's before the creation. So he didn't just suddenly appear for the New Testament. He's there all in the Old Testament, every bit as much and even before it, right? What tells us that we're almost certainly right is what Hagar has to say in verse 13. She says, I am alive, yet I have seen him. Why is, she, why is she surprised to be still breathing if God has appeared to her face to face and she's seen him? What does God say to Moses when he gives the Ten Commandments? What does Moses say? Let me see your face. What does God say? You, you can't see me directly. If you see me directly, you will die. You, your fallen being cannot bear to see me face to face as you are, right? So you have to hide him in the cleft of the rock, remember? He says, wait till I pass by and then you can see me from behind. But you cannot see me face to face. So this Egyptian instinctively knows that who she is could not survive a face-to-face -face encounter with the God of Abraham, with Yehovah, right? And yet, she, she's able to be alive and see him and hear him. That's a second reason for believing this is a Old Testament appearance of Yeshua, of Jesus. Because in the same way, we're not allowed to see the Father face-to-face, -face, we wouldn't survive as we are, but we can see his perfect reflection in his son. Does that make sense? So everything we find out about this angel directly relates to God and very specifically to Jesus. So the attributes of this angel have a great deal to tell us about the attributes of God himself and Jesus in particular. So let's have a look see. So as we said, she's heading for Egypt this spring at Shu'ur. Notice that God meets her by a spring of living water. Now you can't tell that from the English, but it's Hebrew, remember? So in the original script, it's Ayim Mayim, which means a spring of living water. Okay, so it says it specifically in the Hebrew that that's what it is. Jesus meets a woman who's not a Jew, by a well, by a spring, and tells her, go home, you're astray, go home and take your proper place. 
I'm talking about the scripture, right? Or am I? I'm talking about John 7, the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, where Jesus says, I'll give you water that you'll never need to come to this well again, that will well up in you day after day, a spring of living water, by which he meant the Holy Spirit. Whenever you see this picture, it's, it's a picture of the presence of the Spirit of God there. So she's not, it's not just that the angel is there, the very presence, the, sh the, uh, the shaman of his presence, the physical presence, as you would find in the Holy of Holies, you know, it would fill with the cloud of his presence. So that's what this fact that God has stopped there at this spring of living water, that's what it's telling us. So it's major, right? That Yehovah, the God of Abraham, has stopped this Egyptian woman, just like Jesus will stop the Samaritan woman and say, you need to go back to your proper place. That's when he says, go back and submit to the, the authority of your your uh, mistress, he's not being mean. What's he saying? You're messing up the plan that's best for you. I'm going to bless you, but I can't bless you in Egypt. I'm going to bless you where I put you. Go back there. Submit to my design. You know, and I myself will bless you. Never mind your mistress, never mind your master. I myself will bless you. That's what he says to Hagar, right? So we mustn't miss that. In fact, if you look at Isaiah 49, right down the bottom of page one, and also in Isaiah 35, you'll see in both of those it has like this, like here in verse 10, he who has compassion on them will guide them, that's Jesus, the shepherd, and lead them beside springs of water, ayim mayim. Right? So this idea that he will bring them near a spring of water, living water in the New Testament, that's like the promise of the Holy Spirit. The shepherd will bring us to a spring of living water. In fact, he puts it inside us. You know? This is an Old Testament picture of that. And again, she, what's happening here foreshadows what happens with Jesus and the Samaritan woman. So all that's interesting enough, but now we get to the bit that really matters. In verse 11, it says, The angel of the Lord said to her further, Behold, you are with child, and you will bear a son, and you shall call his name Ishmael. Ishmael, most of you probably call him. But in Hebrew, it's Yishmael. And it's made up of three words. It's Ye Shema El, which translates to Shema or the Shema. You know that word already. That's the most, that's like the Jewish equivalent of the Lord's Prayer, the Shema. How does it start? Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Lechenu Adonai Echad. Okay? Shema, to hear. What do you think Ishmael's name means? It means God, El, who hears. Shema. So it's Hagar that adds this name that's used ever after. El Shema, God who hears, one of the 300 names of God, right? So she refers to him and God himself uses it by saying, name your son because I have heard you. And the reason I'm emphasizing that is there's something else that's going to happen in a second to distinguish from hearing. So the first thing he says, I have heard you. Do you think Hagar remembers crying out to him? Is there anything in the story that tells you that she prayed to the God of her master? You know? So, for her, as an Egyptian, running away 
on her own, pregnant. This is amazing that God has not only heard her tiny voice, heard what's going on in her innermost being, but he's turned up in person and said, stop, go back. I will bless you. God who hears me. God who hears. The Where are we now? Just lost my place. The angel, when he speaks that, he uses this phrase, Yehovah Shema Oni, which means God hears, and Oni is the word for affliction, oppression, pain. And it comes from the Hebrew word for being bowed very low, being forced very low. Translating that into modern English, the words the angel is using, Jesus is using, is that God has heard your groaning. Even if you haven't prayed, even if you haven't, you can't remember speaking to him, he has heard the groaning within you. He has heard your affliction. Does that make sense? This gets important later. The idea that even if you're not vocalising it, even if no one around you knows you're in agony, does God know? Yes. He hears the groaning of your innermost being in your secret place. He knows your affliction. He hears it. Hears it. Okay, then the spring that all this happens at is Be'al Lachi Ro'i in Hebrew, which translates to the well of the living one who hears me, no, sees me. God who hears me, God who sees me, God who hears me, God who sees me. What does God see? Did he see what Abraham saw? Did he see what Sarai saw? If we walked past, would he see what we saw? Sure. But what is this really about? Remember, it says in the New Testament, Jesus did not need anyone to tell him about a man, for he knew what was in a man. Right? When God says, I am the Lord who sees you, what is he talking about? It's that last word. What does you mean? He's not talking about the tent. He's not talking about outward appearances. Remember, the whole theme of the New Testament is this contrast between outward appearance and inner reality. He says to the Pharisees, clean the inside of the cup and then the outside will be clean as well. And many, many sayings like that. Because it's what's within you that is the problem. The tent changes every day anyway. Outward appearances, you know, they're a bit random. Certainly with me. <laughs> Depending on what time of day I wake up. So, God who hears me, God who sees me, as he saw Hagar, he knew what was in her heart. She didn't have to say a word. He's telling her. Does she answer back? Does she say, no, no, you're wrong? No, he, she doesn't. Why? Because he's right. The same with the Samaritan woman at the well. Remember how there's that parallel? What does Jesus do to her? He tells her about all these husbands that she's had, remember? It says, even the guy you're with now is not actually your husband. And she rushes into the town, remember? Come see a man who knows everything about me that he could not know. It's the same thing. Her, Jesus was not looking at her outward appearance. 
who's looking at her. God who hears me, God who sees me. In the New Testament, you find this idea in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. The word of God, the word of God is the word of God. It's also Jesus who is the word of God. So whatever it says about the word of God, it's also saying about Jesus. You can't separate the two, right? So the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Do you hear that? It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in creation. How, many, how much is nothing? None. Right? Nothing in creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. He hears everything. He sees everything, even the things you don't say, even the things you keep hidden from everybody. Nothing is hidden from him. Nothing is unknown to him which might sound scary, but actually it's your salvation. <laughs> okay? And this is our point of just starting this way, to be really clear about these attributes of God that he establishes right at the beginning of the story to make sure we understand these things about him. So the two key things that we can learn about his Shem, his name, his character come from two of the many names that he has, which are all that, when we talk about the names of God, because we, he never gives us his actual name, what are we talking about? So sh we know that Shem isn't just your name, like a, what's on your name tag, it's your character, right? All 300 odd na names of God are actually descriptions of aspects of his character. So we, when we say that the 300 Shem of God, God, you could translate that just as well as saying 300 aspects of his character, clear attributes of his character. And these two, he is El Shammah, God who hears everything. Even the silent scream of our heart that no one even next to you knows about, he hears. He is Adonai Ro'e, God who sees everything even the thought and motivation of my innermost being, as Hebrews tells us. In 1 Samuel 2, it says, There is no one holy like the Lord, and no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Do not keep talking so proudly, and let your, and, or let your mouth speak such arrogance, for the Lord is a God who knows and by him deeds are weighed. If he hears everything, and he sees everything, he knows everything. Nothing is hidden from him. So that's what Samuel was chastising the people there. Are you idiots? Do you think you can get away with this unseen by God? Do you think he does not know what you're doing? That's what Samuel's in the context there, right? But for us, the bit we want to grab, he sees it all, hears it all, Therefore, he knows it all. Nothing is hidden from him. So if you're Adam and Eve, what did they find out when they sinned for the first time? Remember what they did? They suddenly realized they were naked. What did they do? They hid. Successfully? No. <laughs> Why? Because of what we just said. When God asked them, what have you done? It's a rhetorical question. He, know, he already knows. He already saw it. He already heard it. He already knows it. <coughs> Slight side note in the, for, for prayer is that's an advantage when you're praying. I've listened to people praying aloud for decades, right? And I see people stumbling over the right words. And when they're stumbling over the right words, do you know what they're doing? It's because they're not sure themselves what's wrong. 
The stumbling is not trying to find the right words so that God understands. They're trying to find the right words because they don't understand what's happening to them. They don't know what to ask for because they don't really know what's happening. So when you hear people doing very long and stumbling sort of, you know, and then argumentative prayers, they're actually arguing with themselves, trying to get down to what is really the thing, right? If you find yourself in doing that, it's exhausting. It's all right, it's a human thing, and God is patient with it, but you will get exhausted by it, right? It's a helpful inoculation against being exhausted to remember that he doesn't need your help to know. In fact, it says in the New Testament that when we don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit himself intercedes for us with unintelligible words, meaning, meaning we won't understand what the Holy Spirit's saying. He's not talking to us. He's talking to God because it says that he knows God's will and he knows because he's part of Elohim, the Trinity. He, know, he has the same attributes as we just said. So the Holy Spirit sees all, knows all, hears all. So while you are stumbling around trying to work out what exactly it is you're trying to ask God for, he already knows. So it's actually okay to, to cut your prayer short and say, Lord, I clearly don't even really know what I should ask you because I really don't know what's happening. That's, so that's the first thing I need is understanding, you know? But you can count on the fact that his answer will not be delayed while he tries to work out what you're talking about. Does that make sense? Anyway, so we come to our actual main topic, but with that big foundation, those two attributes of God and summed up by, you cannot hide from him. Like Adam and Eve, right? You cannot hide. Question, though, can you hide from other humans? Nobody answer other than to yourself. But is there anything that you don't want someone else in the room to find out about you? If you're breathing, the answer is yes. Everybody has that, right? The thing we worry about ourselves, the thing we doubt about ourselves, well, it would be something, right? It doesn't have to be some terrible sin or whatever, but everybody has something like that, right? And we are very, very good at keeping those kind of secrets, at, even from the nearest person to you in your life, right? We are quite practiced actors. We are quite practiced at giving an impression. And this is our topic. Why do we do that? So on page three, you'll find it headed, <coughs> human fear and how that drives human nature. So there's two seemingly innocent questions that actually are unbelievably powerful and they're hugely powerful when you're young, when you're a teenager and trying to work out where you fit in the world and who you are and stuff like that, right? In modern speak, you'd say finding your identity or something along those lines, okay? I'll, I'll let you know when I make it to teenage, I'll tell you. So the first of those questions is, am I legitimate or am I a mistake? You know? Am I legitimate? Should I be here? It, does my life count? Or am I just taking up space like some sort of mistake? In the modern age, can anyone guess? This is true of every human being, right? No exception. This nags and claws self-doubt you know, and self-accusation. It claws and claws at your soul, and it's never so active as when in those formative years, right? 
when you're full of doubt about yourself and whether, where you fit in the world and all that stuff. But there's something about our modern society, let's talk about New Zealand in particular, but I'm sure the Philippines is the same. Actually, I'm absolutely sure it's the same. What do we have a lot of now, more than ever, that would accelerate this, that would tip petrol on this fire for young people? That probably plays into it. What I'm, it's people who only have one parent. So their birth is full of trauma. Their existence in the world marked the beginning of something bad. Why did dad leave? Or why did mum leave? Why doesn't she want me? So you've always had that with people who are adopted. I'm adopted, you know. So you've always had that. But now, I don't know what the statistics are, but, you know, I've heard that in most classrooms at school, a scary proportion of the kids in the class only have one parent. And the other one's just gone, or they're forbidden to see the thing, right? You can't underestimate how much that pours petrol on that fire of doubt, you know? Like if you're the product of a one night stand, <coughs> so your parents didn't even love each other and maybe they couldn't even remember each other's name in the morning. So if you're struggling as a young person and this is part of your story, you're asking your mum, who's my dad? And she's like, well, I don't know what his name was. You know, he was just some guy in a nightclub and I didn't see him again. Like that? It's really common, right? Frighteningly common. What does that do to that person? This kind of question really grows like a monster. So when ordinary life starts telling them that you're not good enough, we've all been teenagers. I'll get there in the end, but what sort of things happen to you that start challenging whether you're a valid person? What sort of things start happening to you, especially at like school, but since you mentioned social media, this is probably where that comes in. What is social media famous for with young people now? Bullying and character assassination, right? Where suddenly you open your social media and there's just all this hate mail because someone's decided to assassinate you, right? So the world is very active in reinforcing the idea that we are a mistake. It is, and then you, what do you do? You try harder, right? What do you start doing? We come to our second question. The second question springs out of it is, what do I have to do to be accepted? What do I have to do to be accepted? So it's this that, you know, because I spent so much time counselling drug addicts and alcoholics and all kinds of gang members and prostitutes and you name it. This is always at the root of it. At some point, they have compromised who they were to try and buy acceptance. So this is where insecure young girls will let insecure boys sleep with them, thinking that that will gain me acceptance in the group. And it kind of does, maybe in that group, but what they don't understand is just as many people now think of them as just a cheap tart. Unacceptable. Don't bring her home to my house. You know what I mean? It's a lie. I just use that example because it's so common. We all encounter it, right? We all know of it. We all know someone it's happening to, or, you know, you will. So there's no point pretending it's not every day, right? 
but it's a classic and a really easy to understand example of how in order to find some sense of place and acceptance by a group, they'll do things they wouldn't otherwise do. They'll smoke a cigarette because everyone in the group does. They'll, have, they'll try marijuana because everyone in the group does. You know? They'll do a burglary because everyone in the group does. Gangs use this. Homeless kids who are desperate for like a sense of family and place. Sure, you can join this gang, but you have to do a couple of burglaries for us first to prove your loyalty. Right? So they play on this. It's unbelievably destructive. The, the amount of destruction depends a little bit on the kinds of things they adopt in order to try and win this sense of place. But can anyone guess the first thing that's happening to them if it works? And to help you, you know, we all like Korean stuff, right? So think of how to become a K-pop idol. So if you're a regular girl or a regular guy, but you can sing and dance a bit, and you want to be a K-pop idol, what do you do? You go and you audition. Let's say you have the misfortune of being chosen. What happens next? They spend years teaching you how to not be you. They won't let you debut or whatever they call it until they've turned your appearance, what people encounter from the outside, into something marketable, into something they can sell. You're making the money, but you know they're selling you. Or are they? No, they're not. They're selling a plastic Barbie doll that they made out of you. Somewhere inside that plastic Barbie doll is their mother's daughter or their father's son still. What do you think that does for people when they've got millions of fans all screaming and they know that what the fans love is an image? And they live inside the image unseen. Do you wonder why so many of those idols commit suicide and leave suicide notes talking about how isolated and lonely they were to the point they killed themselves in spite of having millions of people that would kill themselves to shake their hand once? How crazy it is? I want you to understand this difference between outward appearance and the real person inside. The worst thing that can happen to you is that you become really successful as an actor. That you think, if I'm just like this, or if I change to appear to be this thing or that thing, or I adopt this behavior or that behavior, even though I know it's wrong, but it will, I'll get fans for want of a better word, so forget K-pop for a second, it's all about regular people now. You know, I'll become popular. At school, at work, whatever. I'll get a boyfriend, or I'll get a girlfriend, or something like that. But the worst thing that can happen is you succeed. Now you have to maintain it. Because the person, let's stay with the last one, right? So let's say, you're a girl and you want a boyfriend and you, you, you know you change and you do all these things and then some guy who's cool and who's probably doing the same thing incidentally now he likes you but now you're stuck with the fact that he likes the you that you invented he likes the you that you're projecting and working real hard you know 
making sure that you have the right makeup and the right clothes and the right friends and you're saying the hip things and all of this right. Maybe you're smoking because he does or... I knew girls growing up that changed like chameleons every time they got a new boyfriend. They just morphed into a copy of the boyfriend to please them. And then when they got dumped, they just changed again into the whatever the next guy, right? Can you guess what the point is though? The worst thing that can happen is suddenly you're married and you're in a lifelong partnership with someone who's never met you. And now you have to maintain this character. So I've been a, a main character in one of those soap operas that goes on every day for endless years. You know, Shortland Street or something. You know, where you're a person but no one ever meets you. Everyone only knows the character that you play. And they only relate to the character that you play. No one even knows you or sees you or hears you because you don't let that person be seen because you're afraid that person might be rejected. That's why you did this in the first place. Do you understand? So the Greeks had a word for it because it's acting. It comes from the stage. So they didn't have a lot of female actors weren't like it wasn't really an accepted thing, right? So if there's a female character that was usually played by a man, so they wear a mask. So an actor who portrays a different character by the use of a mask than he is inwardly himself, that type of actor is known as a hypocrite, from which we get the word hypocrite. And we all hate hypocrites. We all hate them. So those people who are living in an endless soap opera where they're playing a role that isn't really them and now they're in a relationship maybe with one person or a group or whatever and they can't turn it off because if people find out you're a hypocrite because that's what you are it's literal meaning that you're a person wearing a mask to portray something to please an audience that real person inside becomes isolated lonely and fear of rejection actually accelerates. And you start to fear, what if I get found out? What if the real me should get seen and they reject me? You understand? Very, very important to, to see that these what we're going to look at now biblically is not just a you know a biblical concept that's nice to add to your book of biblical concepts it applies to very deeply to real life so we know that every every sin is always underpinned by one major sin which is what pride so we have a whole industry that deals with people. Oh, there. We have a whole industry that deals with people with this problem. They call it low self-esteem. That's the industry name for this issue, right? People with low self-esteem. They do all sorts of silly things. But do you know that low self-esteem is a pride issue? So if you're ever counseling someone with low self-esteem, make sure you understand it's a pride issue. You know, what injured pride, the reason they're so crushed, their esteem is self esteem is so low, is because their pride is so high. Injured pride. Okay? So it's that's why Christian counselling is so good for people with low self esteem, for the reasons I'll explain in a second. But pride is right underneath it. Now, if we're going to be Christians, who should we reflect? Goes back to our teaching last week, right? One, one measure, Christ-likeness. We should walk according to his example and instruction. So we should be like little mirrors 
at least in part, or as far as it's up to us, reflecting him, right? You wouldn't want to be reflecting Satan, would you? That wouldn't end well. Let's have a look at something about, we've been looking at attributes of God, and those are things we want to emulate. Let's have a quick look at some attributes of Satan. First of all, what's his name? So everyone will say, well, Satan, isn't it? No, Satan is his job. So everyone refers to Satan as his name, but Satan is his job. Hasatan is the accuser. Okay? So when you talk about Satan, you're actually referring to his job title. His name is Lucifer. Lucifer. And you find him in Isaiah 14. So Isaiah 14, when Isaiah spoke it, its first application is concerning the king of Babylon, the actual king of Babylon in Isaiah's time, right? But there are things in it that we'll see that tell you it's actually also talking about the, the bad guy. Let's have a look. Isaiah 14, verse 12. We're on page 3 in case you, I've lost you. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star. Well, some of your Bibles will say bright morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly on the utmost heights of the mountain. I will ascend over the tops of the clouds and I will make myself like the most high. Summary, I will, I'm not content to serve God, I'm going to be God. This is the attitude of the kings of Babylon who foreshadow Antichrist. Remember the kingdom of Antichrist is referred to in Revelation as Babylon the Great. Everything about this Babylon foreshadows Babylon the Great. The character of Nebuchadnezzar in part foreshadows the character of Antichrist when he comes. But because you understand a bit of Midrash, what can you tell me about this passage that tells you it's not only about that actual historical king? How does it start? You have fallen from heaven. You know? This is a picture of Hasatan, who wants to be God. He challenges what does he say to Jesus? He takes him up on the, when he's, you know, the 40 days of testing. He takes him up on the roof of the temple, right? And he shows him, he shows him all the wonders of the world and all these things, right? What's he keeps asking Jesus to do something? What is it that he keeps asking and Jesus? Obviously, won't agree. What is he asking? He says, just serve me. Let me be God. Don't serve that guy, your father. Don't serve your father. Never mind your father. Serve me and I'll give you all this. Why? What's more important to Satan? Having all that, because he promised to give it to Jesus, right? Having all that? No. Being God. The description here is the core of Lucifer's character. Pride on an unprecedented scale that has him thinking, genuinely imagining that he can challenge God for his place and that he can be the God of the creation and God who made it can just shuffle off to an old folks home somewhere. You know? This is why dominionism, you know I hate dominionism, right? Teaching you nothing there. But that's why I hate this. 
hate it because that's at the heart of dominionism is the church thinking it can step into Jesus' shoes and do it instead of him. That's what kingdom now basically amounts to. So it's the same thing. The creation thinking it can make the creator a spectator. You know, almost redundant. That's why dominionism is so has so much false doctrine in it because it actually shares the character of Lucifer, actually. But here, it talks about him as the sun of the morning, the bright morning star. So that's where you get Lucifer's name from. Lucifer is Latin. It's a Latin name for Venus, the planet. Venus is the brightest star. That's why in some of your Bibles it'll say the bright morning star. It's the first star to appear at night and the last star to disappear at dawn. So it's the last star you can still see before the sun, the brightness of the sun overtakes it and you can no longer see it because of the brightness of the sun. Again, this tells you this is about Antichrist. So he's a false light in the dark. He's the last one. And the, and the light of that star, the light of that star is the last light before the true light comes and obliterates it. So when the dawn comes, that's the light returning, Jesus is the true light. So the dawn coming is a picture of the second coming. Remember, we're in the night right now. When Jesus is here in person, it's day. When he's not here in person, how does the world get the light of God? Only reflected off the moon, right? The sun reflecting off the moon, the church, the moon stands as a picture of the church. Jesus is reflected off us, but he's the source of the light. We only reflect it. So night time refers to the period between the first and second comings. It's night. Day comes again when Jesus comes again. So this calling him the bright morning star references what they already understood about Venus. That um, it's the last false light in the night sky before the real sun appears, which is Antichrist. He's the last false light of the night time before the real sun appears and obliterates and the night ends. Okay? So all those things are good to know and good to understand, you know, anyway, but how does that relate to our topic? Well... Pride, or wounded pride, <coughs> drives that behaviour we were talking about before that causes people to do things they know are wrong, to gain acceptance, to gain, to elevate themselves from what they feel like is a lowly, worthless place in the direction of God, if you like. You know? When you play the world's game, the world is Satan's domain. The nature of the world is Satan's nature. So when you are locked in that pattern of behavior that's sort of everywhere in humanity, you are actually not reflecting Jesus. You're reflecting Satan. You are reflecting his mindset, his attitude, that I can use deception... I can use flattery, I can just flat out lie, I can wear a disguise in order to get what I want, which is I want to be on top instead of underneath. So whether you're talking about Lucifer and he's talking about the creation, 
or whether you're talking about your own life, especially as just a teenager, and you decide that the way to get that place that I want, I'm never going to have it if I stay a good girl or a good boy. I have to start doing things I shouldn't, making up a new character, telling a few lies, lots of lies, etc., etc. right? The point is we have to own the fact that it is Satan's meddling, it's Satan's character that's driving that behavior and that behavior is fundamentally driven by fear. What does the love of God drive out? All fear. What does Satan love to use? Your fear. He plays on it and manipulates it to get you actually playing his game and behaving like him. And you're the loser in the end. Because even when you lose, uh, even when you win, you lose. Like those, I was saying with those K-pop guys with millions of fans, and they end up still end up killing themselves because they're so lonely. You know. What's that telling us is that you've only got two options, haven't you? If you do it the world's way, you're taking your you're, you're mimicking Satan, you're taking advice from the loser. So we better find out about the other way, right? Let's first come back to where we found our opening scripture. Galatians 1, starting verse 6. I am astonished that you so are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel other than that that you accepted from us at the beginning, let them be under God's curse. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or the approval of God? Am I trying to please people? For if I'm still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of God. Scary. But hopefully you're already saying to yourself, all right, because if I'm still in the people-pleasing game, if I'm still trying to get what I think I need by playing a role, by presenting an image, you know, to do what I think the people want in order to gain acceptance, who's God in my life now? Them. Who has the power to tell me whether I'm valid or invalid? Well, I've given it to them, whoever they are. You know, you're a bunch of ditzy school, you know, friends at school or whatever, whoever it is. If you're a K-pop fan, you've given it to your fans. You know, that, so that you hang on how many likes your YouTube page has or whatever to see whether you should kill yourself or not. You know what I mean? You've given all this power of life and death over yeah. yourself to whoever you make God in your life. That's what he's saying here. He's saying, why have you abandoned the gospel? What does gospel mean? What's the translation? Good news. So he's saying, why have you abandoned the good news you received at the beginning for a lie that these people are feeding you. If you're still trying to please those people instead of God who gave you this good news, you are not really his people anymore. You've made, you've made this other crowd your God. And can they save you? 
No. So, it becomes really, really important. Who are we living to please who? So, I've said we're on bottom of page four now. The real issue is this thing of legitimacy, this constant fear and constant worry about, am I legitimate? And with it comes a fear of rejection. Does anyone want to take a guess why fear of rejection is so powerful in human beings? To the point that you'll do the stupidest thing that you know you really absolutely shouldn't in order to avoid being rejected, especially when you're younger. But I only, I only know a few people who weren't like this. <laughs> Why is fear of rejection so hardwired into humans? Why does it bother us so much? What's going to happen at the end of all time? judgment it's the consequence of the fall hardwired into even unbelievers is like a deep understanding that at some point they're going to be judged that at some point they're either going to be in or out a sense of making it or not making it is deeply rooted in us from the fall so even non-religious people, it's just part of their psyche. You know, it's hardwired into humans. The idea that not being accepted is a consequence that can be the worst thing imaginable. Because, of course, at the judgment, that's literally true, right? So even unbelievers have this overwhelming sense that they need to find legitimacy and they need to find a reason for believing that they are legitimate and that they're accepted and that they're loved. Ironically, you need a legitimate reason to believe you're legitimate, which we'll come to in a second. So, consequence of the fall. There's only two options, right? So at the bottom of page four, option one. So the first one is what most people do. So they try and convince the world to love and worship me and give me heaps of feedback. This is the, the heart of Facebook, of course. Give me heaps of feedback to tell me that I'm okay. You know? Why do people care how many likes they get? It's this. Why do people comment on things they probably don't even care about? I think they have to. And then they sit there waiting to see who likes their comment. Why? It's this. Because you've given, your, you've given the validity of your being into the hands of whoever's on the other end of the, you know, whoever's out there that might hopefully give you a like. Does that make sense? You can try and convince the world to love you. Why can that never work? What, let's think of... Let's go back to those K-pop idols who seem to have everything, you know? You've got millions of fans, got a lot of money, got everything you're going, right? And there's, you know, there's just like a million girls that want to marry them. So how could they be lonely, right? Why, why could a human soul in that situation be so, so lonely and so afraid and so unhappy that they kill themselves? What do they know that we've missed? They know it's fake. They're not called idols for nothing. 
they know that what the people love isn't them. Remember what I said before? So I'm using the K-pop thing because it's easier to see. But on a, on a watered-down scale, it applies to anybody you know, right? It's just easier to see an extreme case. For human brains, it's easier to grasp, right? So what happens is, even though every day they're getting heaps of social media saying, you're wonderful, you're great, please marry me, blah, 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 right? The knowledge that they're wearing a mask, the knowledge that you don't know me, you don't see me, right? And we're human beings. So you start to realize that the people giving you praise are fake as well. They're giving you praise because they want you to like them. In fact, the more famous you are, or the more popular, you don't have to be some famous K-pop star, movie star, whatever. You could just be the popular guy at school, right? So all the people wanting to be your friends, why do they want to be your friend? Well, they want you to validate them by friending them. You know it. You know then, well, you can't trust their praise is real. You can't trust that their adoration is real, that it's not actually self-centered, that it's not their game. You're wearing a mask. They're wearing a mask. You want them to validate you. They want you to validate them. How much truth is going on? Zero. So not only is it exhausting to try and maintain this alter ego that you hope sells well, but you can't trust when it works. If it doesn't work, obvious result. It's even worse when it works because you can't trust it. You've got to, make, you've got to keep it going. Classic. Oh, we could stay with the K-pop thing. What happens to what happens to really amazing looking talented K-pop girls when they turn 30? They end up as talk show hosts. Why? Because there's 50, 20 year olds take their place. Right? So that life is like that. There's a point at which you actually can't maintain it because the world stops letting you maintain it. There's a point at which you can't keep your 20-year-old image up because you're 40 and then 50, right? So the world, again, just staying with K-pop because it's easy to grasp the principles from, right? But it applies even to a regular person. But even when it's working, some part of you knows that the people who are liking you and affirming you and all the rest, you actually can't trust what they're saying. Because you realise because you're popular, they want you to affirm them. So they'll say whatever they think you want to hear. So everybody in that game is lying and everyone in the game knows that the other people are lying as well. So how secure is anybody in it? Not at all. Not at all. And that's what it, society is like. And that's why we have massive portions of a population with psychiatric illness. And that's why we have suicide. And that's why we have all manner of self-harm, alcoholism, drug taking, because people are so insecure and what does the world say? Oh, ask yourself this. When you come across someone who's really down, have you ever come across someone who's just really down on themselves and everything, and you say, don't worry, we love you, right? How do they react? Almost every time. How do they react? They don't. You may as well have read out your grocery list. You wonder yourself why? Because they assume you're lying. Because they assume you're only saying that 
so that they will feel better, which will make you feel better, that you're saying it so that you will feel better. Why? Because that's what they'd do. Another example of liars, understanding that other people are liars and therefore, you know, everybody's lying, so there's no confidence in anything said. The words don't have any power because the source of the words fallen. Which brings us to option two, page five. Option two is much harder. It takes a great deal of courage because you have to get on the cross. So in, in option two, I don't wear a mask. In option two, I don't try and convince anybody of anything about me. In option two, I don't ask any human at all to validate me. None. Why wouldn't I? Why? They're liars. Not in a harsh way, but they're incapable of being objectively true with me because their own insecurity will <coughs> cause them to say what they think I want to hear. Right? So I have to basically forget about getting my validation from another created being. And I have to go to the only reliable source of absolute, impartial truth from whom I cannot hide. Who understands the things that I can't even explain because I don't understand me well enough to explain them. Where would I go? Maybe I'll go to someone from whom nothing can be hidden. Maybe I could go to someone who hears everything even when I haven't spoken it. He hears my distress even before I cry out. Who might that be? God who hears. Remember? El Shema, God who hears. Adonai Ro'e, God who sees. He is God from whom nothing can be hidden. As Adam and Eve found out, like we said, you know, you can't hide. And as it said in Hebrews, remember, he sees all, he understands all, even the thought and intention of your heart, that your mask can hide, your, your persona that you're trying to have accepted, that you've created, and you're trying to maintain, that can truly work in hiding you from even your nearest and dearest, but it can't hide you from him. The essential you, your spirit within you, the eternal part of you, not the tent, right? And it's that part of you, actually, that has the most fear of rejection. Because deep down, thanks to the fall, we have this sense of final accountability in some way in which I, in some way, shape or form, I need to be accepted because being rejected is going to be bad. When you're a Christian, you understand what that is, but even when you're a non-Christian, there's just this nagging thing, you know, a hangover from the form. So I come to the Lord. Affirm me. Tell me how great I am. Tell me that I'm good. Tell me that I'm smart. Tell me that I'm talented. Tell me that all the things that I was thinking about getting the world to tell me, you tell me instead, because then I can trust it, right? Fair enough, right? You can trust whatever he says. He's impartial, right? Problem. What does he tell me? You're a washout. You're a sinner. You know, the sum of your wisdom wouldn't make it to the back of a cornflakes packet. You know? Your talent is not extraordinary. Your ability is incredibly limited. 
you're a fail. Why does he say that? Because it's true. Humans, on their own, are spectacularly unimpressive, except in their own minds. Human society, based on pride, lies flat out to each other about how great we are, except we aren't. Look at all the technology we've created. Suddenly, wait, global warming, how'd that happen? Oh, wait, was that our technology? <laughs> you know, we're really, really successful at being stupid. We are. We know how to make better bombs. How clever is that? But we're good at it. You know, the only the, the main advance in military practice is now you can kill people by the tens of thousands a day instead of by the hundreds. But is that clever? <laughs> From God's perspective, we are dumber than a dumb thing. You know? So how what's this doing to my self esteem now? Oh my god, why did I come to you? I was looking for a bit of a cheer up, thanks a lot. Because I'm thinking about, you know, I'm standing here and I'm not very good looking and I'm, oh, you know, not very talented and that compared to Miggy over there. You know, so I'm thinking, thanks, Lord. I mean, I already felt small next to Miggy, you know, and now I feel like you know, the rear end of the mouse. Oh, it's not just a mouse, it's just his rear end, you know. And what does God say? Well, don't worry. He's as bad as you. All have fallen short. All have sinned. No one, zero, has any cause to boast. Absolutely the truth is nobody has any right to think of themselves as greater than their neighbour. Absolutely, objectively, the truth doesn't need sustaining. The truth is just sits there of itself. Doesn't that take any energy to maintain? A lie takes an enormous amount of energy to keep going. The truth doesn't need any batteries at all. Right? So the whole truth, the scary truth is I'm not, you know, there isn't much reason for me to exist. When I was, um, one of the things that made me a Christian was at school, I was a science laboratory monitor. And my particular task was to keep the fruit fly population alive in this aquarium that the biology department used. And even at 16 years of age, I understood there was something I was supposed to be understanding by the fact that fruit flies are born, they eat, they mate, have more fruit flies, and three days later, they die. So their whole life cycle is about three or four days. They achieve absolutely nothing. You know? And I kept thinking, what is the point? But actually, humans, human beings are not that much advanced on fruit flies. Most of society does just exactly that. They get born, they eat, you know, they have kids, they die, and then their kids do exactly that. Not much else, right? This sounds all gloomy, but it's actually scriptural, which I'll show you in a second. The reason this doesn't crush me and wipe me out is, the, is what God says about everybody else. You don't need to look up to any of these other people. They only think they're greater than you. You're all in the same level, actually. As you are, without me, you are nothing. So it's a relief. Instead of it being a blow, when I discover that I'm normal, It's a relief. I don't have to do anything to be as good as the other guy because the other guy isn't any different from me, actually. Does that make sense?
But then the news gets better because he says, but you don't have to stay that way. I can give you a purpose that will last. Not like a fruit fly, you know, that gets born, eats a bit, and dies, leaves sort of no trace of itself, really. I can give you a purpose that's of eternal value. That's why Jesus says, store up your treasure in heaven where moths and rust can't get at it. Why? What's he really saying? He says, be active in something that actually matters, that has a result that endures, instead of in the futility of the great soap opera called humanity, in which everyone's acting and trying to outact each other to gain some sense of legitimacy that can never last because either you won't be able to sustain the acting or the world will do something like with a model who gets to 40 and nobody books her anymore. You know, life just crushes it. So the gospel, remember what it said in Galatians, why are you abandoning the good news to listen to this other garbage? Don't you know that living to please men is death? Why are you abandoning the good news? What's the good news? The good news is that even though you all start off equally worthless, in Christ, you can be a new creation. And the new creation is worth what God paid for it. To God, who's the only judge in the end, you worry about being rejected? You've got a choice. If you become Christ, the world will reject you. He said so. But if you try and gain your credibility from the world, it's Jesus that will reject you because you've made the world your God instead of him. Understand? So the good news is you can leave the whole game. The gospel is that you can be a new creation with an eternal purpose. You can be in the world, but not of it. You can have an assurance of legitimacy because you are newly created by the will of God. The one you're trying to please assures you you're not a mistake. He made you on purpose. You know Psalm 139? See, I have carved you in the palm of my hand. I have formed you on purpose. That's what God says to his own people. Let's just, on page five, there's a couple of scriptures we just need to shoot through. Just to give some scriptural assurance that what I'm saying about the rest of the world being useless is not made up. Jeremiah 51, verse 58. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Babylon's thick wall will be leveled and her high gates set on fire. The peoples, the nations, exhaust themselves for nothing. The nation's labour is only fuel for the flames. All the struggling of mankind to be its own God and to accomplish what it thinks it's building is in vain. It's all just fuel for the fire. Habakkuk 2, verse 12. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and establishes a town by injustice, by deceit. Has not the Lord Almighty determined that the people's labour is only fuel for the fire, that the nations exhaust themselves for nothing? Fruit flies. Proverbs 19, verse 20. Listen to advice and accept discipline. At the end, you will be counted amongst the wise. Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. The rest is in vain. What a person desires is unfailing love to be secure. Better to be poor than a liar. Better to be poor than a liar. That goes back to what we've, I've been talking about. 
you know, living a lie. It's better to have one real friend, God, than to be living in the middle of a lie. You couldn't be poorer than that. Let's... Okay, right at the bottom of page five, you'll see this principle is so important to God that he made a law about it. Over on page six, we're almost home now. If he can find the right page, what have we done with it? So again, we need to understand what the purpose of law period is. Let's look in Deuteronomy 6. Hear Israel, so Shema Israel, and be careful to obey so that it go so that it may go well with you and that you may greatly increase in a land flowing with milk and honey just as the Lord the God of your ancestors promised you. This is where the Shema comes from actually. Hear O Israel the Lord your God the Lord is one Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk on the road and when you lie down and when you get up. The law is given to bless us. You know? If we were in a combat zone and there's a minefield and you just learned that somewhere outside the camp, outside the wire, there's thousands of mines. You know? One guy says, careful outside, there's thousands of mines. The other guy says, here's a map of the minefield. You just follow this, it's been cleared, you can walk through. Which one loves you? It's the second one, right? Because he didn't just tell you about the mines, he told you how to get through them without being blind to bits. What is the map? That's the rules. Follow this path, or else you will be blind to bits. But follow this path, don't disobey, follow this path, and you'll come out the other side of the minefield, no worries, no problem. That's a law given to save you. All the laws of God are like that. The church misunderstands the laws as being something about God having an, being small-minded and having like an ego problem and being full of like, well, you can't do this and you can't do that. It's not God at all. All of God's law, he says, keep these instructions that it may go well with you, that you may inherit the promises I've made to your fathers. Follow this map through the minefield because I want you to get out the other side without being blind to bits. Understand? With that in mind, we look at the Ten Commandments in the chapter before. Number seven, you shall have no other gods before me. Sorry, verse seven in Deuteronomy 5. You shall have no other gods before me. Verse eight, you shall not make for yourself an image, an idol, in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord, am a jealous God. Those who love me keep my commandments, right? I, the Lord, am a jealous God. Keep my commandments. He forbids idolatry. People will look at this and they think that this is an ego problem with God. When he says, I am a jealous God, what do you think he means? What do you think he means? What does jealous normally mean? Well, here's a clue. Most people's minds leaps to jealous of something. This is not the Hebrew meaning. So if I, you know, if I've got my old Land Rover and someone goes past in a brand new Range Rover, if it was someone other than me, because I couldn't care less, but if it was some other guy, they might be jealous of 
the other guy because he's got a better Land Rover, right? So we tend to think of jealousy as being jealous of something, you know, which is like coveting, that kind of jealousy. I want what he's got. That, can you imagine God who gave the command, you should not covet your neighbor's goods, being jealous like that? It doesn't actually mean it at all. He's not jealous of anything. He's not, if you worship an idol, he's not jealous of the idol. Like, I wish I was that idol because, you know, look, there's Alan giving all his attention to that idol and I wanted Alan's attention, so I'm jealous of that idol. I wish I was that idol. Can you imagine God saying that? No, right? So you can see it doesn't mean that at all. What else could it mean then? In the Hebrew, it's not jealous of, it's jealous for. And the Hebrew word that's translated as jealous is actually really intense. It means zealously jealous. Zealous in his jealousy for you. He hates the idols. Why? Because the idols are thieves. Why does he hate you trying to get your legitimacy from humans? living to please men because he knows what that will do to you and he knows that will rob you of actually being valid that will rob you of salvation that will rob you of a really legitimate purpose an eternal treasure you'll be a fruit fly that's why God hates the idols he hates them for your sake he is jealous for you when he says do not commit idolatry for I am a jealous God that is the meaning of it he's not jealous of the idols he's jealous for you he gave these laws for your protection and blessing not out of small minded jealousy which is how people often read it does that make sense so you see an example in Isaiah 63, which there's many, many examples of this, but this is halfway down page six. This is when God decides that he's, people have been in captivity long enough. Now he's going to deal with um, Babylon. So he says here, it was for me a day of vengeance. A year for me to redeem had come. See the contrast there? Well, which is it? Is he going to redeem or is it about vengeance? It's about both. It's vengeance against Babylon to redeem his people. He treats the two lots differently. He keeps his law to save his people and to deal with his enemies in one breath. His furious vengeance against evil is to protect his own. Does that make sense? He's jealous for them. I looked, but there was no one to help. I was appalled, but no one gave support. So my own arm achieved salvation for me, and my own wrath sustained me. That's because that Hebrew word for I am a jealous God means zealous, zealous, you know, jealousy. That's why the wrath of God comes into it. So, you know, yeah, to save the remnant of Jacob, he will obliterate the kingdom of Antichrist and everything that serves it. Jealous for his possession. Jealous for his covenant. Jealous for the blood of Jesus that paid for it. Jealous for his own shem, for the blessing and salvation of the bride. Jealous for us. So, imagine then how God looks upon people who are seeking to gain their sense of identity and validity and legitimacy, self-esteem, whatever, from a bunch of idols, from, you know, the people you work for living for their praise or your social group 
Well, you know, especially as I said at the beginning, this applies extra applies to like teenagers and those in the formative years because you've got all those, all of this is accelerated on steroids at school because everyone is dazed and confused about who they really are and so it's all, you know, going a million miles an hour. But for God, it's sickening and fills him with grief when we turn to a bunch of natural born liars who are all acting and pretending to validate each other because they want validation back. That's all fake. When he's there the whole time saying, I made you, I see you, I know you, who you really are. And I sent my son to make a way for you to be saved. What could validate you more than God of his own will pays that kind of price to have you. Do you understand why paying, why Jesus paying such a high price is so it's a valuable thing to grasp? A thing is worth what someone's worth to pay for it. To have you, what did Jesus have to do? What kind of price is that? That's what you're worth to him. You know, if you're a K-pop star, your worth is measured in dollars, or won, <laughs> you know, to, to the owners of the company until you don't make them any money anymore, right? Not so with God. Your friends at school often, if they're not getting from you what they want, you get dumped. You know, they'll move to someone who will give them what they want. It's all fake. It's idolatry. That's why God hates it, because it robs you. Because it will fail you. And worse, it will corrupt you, because you'll buy into this ridiculous game of trying to be someone other than who you really are, doing things you know you shouldn't do, all to gain the approval of people who don't know how to tell the truth anyway, so you can't even trust it when they do approve you. And the whole time, Jesus is there saying, you're all equal in my sight. None of you have any cause for boasting, but be my disciple and I can give you a validity that's eternal, a purpose that's not a fruit fly's life, you know? that I can give you a kind of self-esteem that isn't pride because it's valid. You know? I can give you a, I can bring you into agreement with me about you. So you'll be able to agree with me that though you're a sinner, you are loved, you are wanted, you're the bride that I've chosen and that I've paid a terrible bride price to have. You wonder if you're worth something? You know? That's what you're worth. Does that make sense? I hope so. Last page, I'm going to zoom through it quick. So let's have a look in the New Testament, just to make sure, because a lot of that's Old Testament, right? Has to be because we're talking about fundamental qualities of God and changing his character. James chapter 2. And this applies a bit to what we did last week about just applying one standard only and treating others as you want them to treat you by that one standard. And if you're in the new generation thing, Alex's um, lesson on judging others and all the rest of it, this also comes into it as well. So, my brothers and sisters, believe in our glorious Lord Jesus um, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, 
you stand there or sit on the floor at my feet, have you not discriminated amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. It is not the rich, uh, sorry, is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? But if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, partiality, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Now, that word favoritism, so do I need to explain that? It's pretty straightforward, right? That word favoritism is really interesting because obviously that's English, right? In the original text, it's Greek. You don't have to learn the Greek word, but learn this. It doesn't mean what you think. What would you imagine favoritism from the original Greek? What do you think the definition of the original word is likely to be something like? What would you imagine? Don't show favoritism. What's your hunch that that word favoritism probably means? Just in ordinary English. Don't show. It's not rocket science. It's not a trick question for a change. What do you think? Treat everyone the same, Treat everyone the same right? Be impartial. One standard. That's why I said it relates back to last week. You know, one measure. That's why love your neighbor as yourself, including your enemies. Remember, even the pagans can love those who love them back, but you love your enemies the same. One standard, one measure. As Christ loved you while you were yet a sinner, love sinners who might yet be saved. One standard. Right? And it does partly mean that. But the big surprise why I included this is the actual word, it's really surprising what the core of its meaning is. It's a word that talks about surface appearance. Judging by appearances. Judging by the mask. Remember what we're talking about? Do not treat some people as more favorable because you like what you see. You're impressed. You're buying into their game. That's not taking Christ's view of the person. That's buying into their game. Whereas this poor person in their filthy clothes, the surface appearance of that person is, well, you know, There'll be some soup for you later when I finish giving the cream buns to this guy over here. Right? Because of someone famous or people always say to me on movie sets, do you know who that guy you're talking to was? I'm like, yeah. And? And it'd be some famous actor, right? Or whatever. But to me, they're just somebody's son. You know? They're just, someone, they're just another fruit fly unless they get saved. All of their labours are finally just fuel for the fire. In a few generations, no one will remember them. You know? Or if they make a dud film, they, they'll be forgotten before they even die. You know? So why should you be like... They're just a person to me. And I'm known for that, right? But... People don't realise it's because of this. So James is actually really firm here, saying, what are you doing? Judging by appearances, showing favouritism, because that's what it really means, the original word, is altering your behaviour by what you see, by the 
image that they are projecting to you, you're letting that influence how you treat them. That's going backwards into thinking, ooh, important person. If I can get them to like me, I'll be more important. You're making an idol out of them. Treating them special is a sin for that reason. But understand the reason God hates it is because of what it does to you. He's not jealous of them. He's jealous for you. That's why he doesn't want you to do it. So if you can get this absolutely right, if you, if you can mature, it's a process, right? It takes some maturing. But if you can get to where, on the balance of things, You'll never get to where what people say and think about you means nothing at all. But you need it to be the lightest thing. You know, when I was counselling, we used to have a, have a saying that you can work with insane people until they start making sense. Then it's time to get out. So you have to take that view with humans' response to you. and So you listen. Occasionally, you might have, they might have something valid to say, but then you go to God about it, you know? So you can be in a world full of crazy people. You can work with them. You can work in the middle of it. But you must recognise it for what it is. Don't make the mistake of thinking it's valid. Don't let it be an idol, because it will rob you of actual legitimacy. It will rob you of actual peace. I haven't put it in the notes here, but for you ladies, you know about the beauty of holiness, right? Where Paul warns them that the women of God are not to cover themselves in makeup or braid their hair and that. So if you're a legalist, you'll say, well, you're not allowed to wear makeup. No daughter of mine's having lipstick. You know, and you're, you're definitely not going to the hairdresser because if you come back with your hair braided, that's it, you're out. It's not what Paul was saying. <laughs> He's talking about this. The woman of God should be beautiful from within. The beauty of holiness, holiness, Kodesh, means set apart. Your beauty sh is, should be that you are not like the world, that you are set apart from it, that when people meet you, Regardless of how you look on the outside, what affects them is who you are on the inside. And the reason the instruction is to women and not to men is because it's meant to be taken as an instruction to the church, to the bride. You know? But when we think about our topic tonight, it's the same deal, isn't it? That way, if you are if you are the K-pop singer, but if you've got the beauty of holiness, and I'm sure there are some, like, who are real, like, they're not that plastic, then even when they're 50 years old, people will come and hear them sing. People will still care about them. People will still remember them. Because they were never in love with the Barbie doll. So when the Barbie doll melts off, you know, and there's the old ladies left standing behind. They won't care because they were never in love with the mere surface appearance. They cared about the person inside. Does that make sense? That's what the beauty of holiness is meant to be about. So it endures even to when you're old and wrinkly and grey, but you still glow. We all know people like that, right? So... I think, are we done? I think so. Let me just check. Ah, last bit. So, remember we said all this is driven by fear of rejection. So for Christians, this becomes critical and it comes, becomes more critical the closer we get to the end because what did Jesus tell us was going to happen to us? The world will hate you. Not only will it hate you, it'll stop accepting you, it'll reject you, it'll try and get rid of you. So if you've based your sense of 
you know, well-being, identity, validity on how the world responds to you, you're dead. Because if you keep identifying as Christian, you're dead. Say, so, oh, you're a Christian. We don't want you around anymore. What? But, but I'm, I'm me. You're my friend. Oh, no, we don't like Christians. So if your whole world is based on how the world sees you, accepts you, you're in big, big, big trouble. Worse, you might think that's so important that you abandon Christ to please them to keep their acceptance at the cost of his acceptance. Super dangerous, right? So since he's warned us in advance that rejection is going to be a part of our world as Christians, it takes the sting out of it. You know, we just accept it for what it is. And if you're not basing your worth on it in the first place, if you lose it, what have you lost? Not much. Which brings us to a very final point. Everything has to have more than one witness. Right? This is probably a bit unfair, but can anyone guess what we must always do in order for the, our sense of worth, our sense of identity, our sense of validity, if we're only looking to Jesus for it, what are we going to have to do to meet that law that says no matter is established by less than two witnesses? What are we going to have to do? I'll give you a clue. You're doing it right now. What was that? Perfect answer. Gold star for Mary Grace. Fellowship. No matter how strong your faith, if it's just you and the Lord, it's one witness. Doubt will creep in, right? God, that's why God does everything through the body, not through individuals. You are part of the body. We'll do this as a teaching. But you're a part of the body. You're not the whole deal, right? We must operate as a body because God knows that as much as we want to just believe him in an absolute sense, one witness will never settle it. We need each other's encouragement. We need each other's prayers. We need... You know, so those are, those are like truth upon truth upon truth, further witnesses just reinforcing what we already know from him. That's what fellowship allows. So we mustn't give up fellowship. It's super important. You know, I think we're done. We are done. 7.30, not bad, eh? How's that? My wife said, you had to be finished by 7.30. See there? It can be done. So, yeah. So read through those notes again. Maybe watch this again. You can see why it's so important for your own kids, so important for each other. And you can see why it's, there is that time of your life when you're in that formative stage where all of this is just a minefield, right? So under, being able to explain this to someone else to help them understand it can save them a multitude of grief if they're a believer or maybe it's a way of helping them be a believer in the first place. Right? So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your loving kindness. Moreover, Lord, we thank you that you said you'll be found by those who are not looking for you, that you choose us, that you draw us by your Holy Spirit, that you, Lord, have made it clear that we don't have to worry about whether you want us. The fact that we know you at all means that you wanted us from the beginning, that you that came to find us, that you that drew us, that you that went on the cross for us, that paid the price for us to establish what we're worth in eternity. To you, the only judge, the only one whose opinion will actually finally count, whether we're rejected or not rejected, it's really the same, Lord, as whether we're saved or not saved. So we pray not for only for ourselves, Lord, that we would stay away from idolatry and no longer allow the opinions of other people to rule us or dictate who we are. But the, we would learn, Lord, by the help of your Spirit, how to obtain those things from you. 
and to stand in you and be confident in that, even when the world doesn't like us and doesn't want to know us, even in the midst of trouble, Lord, so that we can have peace in this storm. We pray, Lord, for those who are struggling with us right now, especially the young, especially teenagers who are in those troublesome years, Lord, trying to figure out who they are. We pray for those who've made bad choices, Lord, who are doing things they know they shouldn't to try and gain acceptance. We pray, Lord, that you'd deliver them out of it, you make them wise into salvation, and that you'd send them help and fellowship so they would have what is right instead of what is wrong, what lasts instead of what doesn't, that they wouldn't live like fruit flies anymore, but have an eternal purpose and an eternal value. In you, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. That's it. Shalom. I think it might be New Generation next week. Week after? Week after. You heard it here first. Okay. Good night. <laughs>